Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon session of the She Loves Tech Global Summit 2021. I am honored and delighted to be on this panel with some of the best investors in Asia. Wei Holtman, founding partner of Upper Ventures, Kathy Matsui, founding partner, Empower Partners, Helen Wong, founding partner, QR Ventures. Apparently, what the data shows us is that there are less than a thousand women around the world who have actually set up their own funds. So I'm in very esteemed company here today. I'm proud to call these ladies my friends, mentors, and 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 our role models. So 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 first and foremost, ladies, what actually um, caused you to to decide to build your own funds? You know, was there a turning point? Was there a eureka moment, or was it just something which was organic? Maybe we can start with uh, Wei. Um, well, thank, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. And, and uh, at Arbor, we've had the honor to work with both Kathy and Helen, so I consider them both colleagues and friends and, and mentors and people I admire as well. So thank you for, for having me. Um, you know, I always do, people ask, how do you start a women-led fund? Well, I say I don't have a choice but to start a women-led fund because I couldn't start a, male, a man-led fund. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, it's about... Right. What are you passionate about? Do you have a point of view that that is unique? Do you have a differentiated strategy or perhaps domain expertise and a, and a set of network that others may not have that, that can give you that extra edge to pursue something that you, you care about? And for me and my co-founder, Melissa, um, you know, we cared about working with entrepreneurs. This is what gets us out of bed every single day. We love doing investing. We saw an opportunity in fintech earlier than perhaps others did. And, uh, you know, that's what got us started. Kathy? Yeah, so I think I may have a bit of an unusual background for venture in that I uh, worked for three decades in essentially sell-side research. And my research targeted mainly listed Japanese companies, so much bigger scale than what I'm uh, looking at today. But my two partners, Yumiko Murakami and Miwaseki, we've actually been um, personal friends for over two decades. We actually ha happen to share the same birth year and birth month. So on a birthday celebration dinner a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, we had a very introspective discussion about what should we do with the rest of our lives? Uh, we're of course not spring chickens. So we had to <laughs> make a decision that we wanted to stick with and we want to work together. And the combination of you know, Japan really facing a lot of macro challenges, desperately needing sources of growth and innovation, plus our combined uh, background and experience in corporate governance matters, in gender diversity issues, uh, which happen to be now be called ESG, we thought, why don't we try an ESG-focused VC fund? And that's what we've done. So it wasn't really this intent of, oh, we're all women, so let's start a women-led fund. They're two of my best friends. <laughs> uh, we, we love each other. We want to do something together. And um, yeah, that's how it started. Thank you, Kathy. Helen. Yeah, um, I have been in venture capital since 2000. So uh, it's been 20 years. And I have been at two very um, good firms. You know, uh, I was a founding team member at GGV. And then uh, I was a partner at Chiming for... A long time about eight years so I think um, I'm ready basically that you know I have seen um, multiple cycles I have also seen um, and gone through the whole you know uh, process of uh, from fundraising to investing to portfolio management to exits um, so I think uh, that's the reason for me to want to start something on my own and um, yeah so happens that I'm a woman so this is uh, going to be a female at fun Thank you, ladies. Um, it, you know, I think uh, people are actually very, very curious and, you know, as to the sort of the journey of actually building a fund. Maybe I'll start with Kathy first, because you're saying that um, after a 30-year career at Goldman Sachs um, in Japan, mostly on the sell side, on the equity side and looking at listed companies, you decided to sort of build this with with basically two of your, two of your best friends. Um, I mean, you know, was it was it purely an, an instinct thing? Like, like I think, how do you choose your, your your partners? Was it just 
coincidence? Was it just the time or, or was it just that you felt that they, they had strengths which complemented yours, you know, bound by, by, by the same values? I find picking partners, uh, when I pick partners for Teja, it took me a long time um, actually to land on my on, on my two partners, uh, Mei Tong and, and David Sukasing. So I think people are curious about how you build your team. Yes, and I think everybody perhaps has a different path to fund formation. But in my particular case, as I mentioned, you know, these are two women who I've worked with. Uh, one was my client. Um, they both uh, work with me on a nonprofit together for many years. So there's this already established um, relationship of trust. And it goes without saying, without that trust, it's very hard to form a, a company uh, together that you're pretty much going to spend much of your waking hours uh, together with. And number two, when we decided to embark on this adventure, we made a mutual promise that whatever happens, we'll stay friends. <laughs> and we weren't going to do this if this would risk that friendship. And that was really important to us. Um, but yes, we, we are three in, in some ways quite similar, but in other ways we have our strengths. Uh, I definitely have weaknesses. Um, and so I think we're quite complementary. We have also hired uh, now almost six, close to seven people in just the last six months. So really ramping up. And in that case, we happen to be mostly female. Uh, we have one male uh, partner on the team who's fantastic. But again, it's, it's more about, you know, we're trying to find the best quality talent uh, in the market. And we happen to find more, more women than men. But um, that wasn't, you know, the original intent. But we're, we're, we're really excited. How, how do your partners complement you? In terms of, of, of strengths? You know, like, is there a dynamic in which you work together and make decisions? Yeah, so we, we each share an equal uh, percentage of, of the, the, the partnership and we have known each other for so long that we, we already recognize what we are good at and we're not so good at. And it's not like, you know, there are very thick black lines between us and what our roles and responsibilities are, but over the kind of fullness of time in the last, I guess, year or so, we've kind of fallen into okay, this is what, you know, you're responsible for, this is what you're good at. And so far, it's, it's, it's worked out very well. Of course, there are areas of overlap. So we're thinking about, you know, uh, recruitment, and, um, you know, uh, we have a very big focus on ESG integration in our portfolio companies. So that's a very big chunk of what we're doing. So we're all kind of hands on in that uh, arena. Uh, we all did the fundraising together, um, you know, LP relations, uh, we're all sharing that burden. Uh, but other stuff, you know, we're trying to divide and conquer. Thank you, Kathy. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's great, great learning, because I think in different funds, um, you know, they're structured differently with, with different responsibilities. Way, um, you and Melissa, you know, um, you know, for as long as I've known you and in the, in, in, in the industry have been known as, you know, the dy dynamic duo. How do you and Melissa sort of complement each other? How, how did you find each other, actually? Um, I, mean, I think maybe similar to Kathy and Melissa, you know, and her partners, Melissa and I have known each other prior to launching Arbor. Um, when I, uh, prior to Arbor, I was head of Asia uh, for City Ventures. So I, I was a strategic investor in the fintech space. Melissa was uh, head of Asia for Vantage Point, which was a Silicon Valley based uh, VC fund. And, you know, in our respective roles, we met um, looking at startups together. We ended up co-investing together, sat on boards together. And became friends as well but it, you know it gave us opportunity to see how each other worked how we may look at perhaps the same deal or the same issue from a different perspective and i think we develop you know mutual level of trust and uh, respect for each other even if we don't always have to agree on every single point um and you know we both maybe at, at similar uh, points in our life decided, you know, what do we want to do in the next stage of our life? And both decided to, to make the leap to leave, a, you know, a big platform and try to do something on our own. And also she and I have both been entrepreneurs in our prior lives. So this, you know, to start your own fund, it's like becoming an entrepreneur all over again, all over again right? You no longer have the big brand that, that you, you had before you know, all the resources that came with uh, big institutions. So starting everything from scratch, um, you know, we, we, we're the tea ladies and we're the managing partners all at the same time. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it's finding somebody who's willing to do that with you 
Um, you know, we had a lot of laughs doing, you know, road trips, raising capital. It wasn't always easy, um, but I think we, we kept each other sane and that made a big difference, right? Wait, you and Melissa, you know, divide sort of uh, fundraising and investing or you guys, both of you do both? Um, you know, we do both. I think certainly at the beginning, Melissa, because she came from a more um, traditional fund, whereas I came from the strategic strategic side she had more experience on the fundraising you know at raising an independent fund certainly so that's something i learned a lot from her over the years um and you know where whereas i probably certainly in the early days had more you know re, sort of responsibility or, or uh, you know uh, experience working with strategics which we do with a lot but because we're focused on fintech we spend a lot of time with strategic players and incumbents in in the sector right um, but at this point, you know, it's really in terms of division, it's really, you know, there, there are different subsectors within FinTech that we may each like or gravitate towards or there's specific geographies um, that we each like or gravitate towards or perhaps have more relationships and networks in. Um, but we, you know, we try to try to split our roles as, as much as, you know, we can. Thank you, Wei. Um, Helen, maybe you can tell us, what do you look for in a partner? <laughs> Or are, or are you even looking for one? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because I think I'm different from Wei and Kathy in that I'm just starting my journey. So maybe I like to keep things under wraps for now. <laughs> but I can talk about, you know, like in the past, um, both at Chiming and at GGV, we had very strong uh, female partners. And I think that, you know, female partners are as capable as male partners. Um, you know, I think that the they bring maybe something different to the table when there are certain uh, board dynamics. Um, but really at the end of the day, it's, you know, about how capable you are. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of capable women out there. Um, I mean, at, at GGV, for example, we had the previous uh, chairwoman of the Bright Dairy Group uh, on uh, as, as one of our partners. And, you know, she brought years and years of um, operation experience. And I thought... Uh, that I, I mean, I learned a lot from her. So I think uh, choosing partners is, yeah, it's, it's the same as, you know, most things. You just have to have a certain level of trust. And I think that trust is really based on that person's, um, you know, capability and also that person's, um, you know, ability to work as a team member. Uh, I think those are probably the two three key attributes I would look for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank, thank you, Helen. Um, I think in my own experience, um, I feel trust and values alignment actually is even, you know, way more important than any kind of competence. Uh, I, I've realized every time I've gone with values, you know, we've stayed together. And and when I've just gone for, you know, someone who's just super capable, super track record without values alignment, um, you know, it, it, it's usually harder for it, for it to work out. Um, I want to turn the spotlight on to, to Wei right now. Um, Wei, very memorably at the beginning of my own journey, sat down in the coffee shop with me in Shanghai. Um, and at the time, I, I literally, when I first started Teja, I had no idea what fundraising was. I did not come from VC, and neither did I come from um, actually institutional investing. I was a lawyer and I was an investment banker, and then I started building communities. So I was, I was honestly, you know, very lost at the time. And I think Wei gave me some, still some of the best fundraising advice, which has made, you know, Teja, Teja's Ventures first fund possible, and, and we've now closed it. And I think Wei basically said to me, you know, just just raise whatever you can, deploy it, raise, deploy, show your exit. You know, it's not about the, the, a number. It's not about you know how large your, your first fund is. It's about how 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 good it is. You know, Wei, what what is the difference? Um, you know, um, between you know when you raise your first fund, and and your second, and then your third. Sort of, what do you think were you know the factors for for your success, and and how was it different raising the first versus the second and the third fund? Um, you know, I, I think like everybody, when you're starting out, right, you, you're unknown. You know, we may have been known in our prior careers without prior firms, but as an individual or as a first time brand new fund together, a partnership, you know, we were we were unknown. Um, so, you know, so it's about what else can you demonstrate, right? What, what What's going to differentiate you? So, you know, we decided we want to pick a domain focus. We didn't want to be a, a, a generic fund. Um, we felt that was important to show our value, you know, differentiation in terms of, you know, what we're good at. Um, but, you know, we got lots of questions, you know, are you a China fund? You're not a China fund. Why are you only focus on one specific sector? And this was, you know, eight years ago where fintech is not what it is today. 
So people are like, why fintech? How big of a market can that possibly be? Um, so, you know, it wasn't always easy, but I think we were quite fortunate. You know, we, I mean, maybe because some of our backgrounds having worked with strategics, you know, we ended up with some very important strategics in financial services as um, anchoring LPs, and that really helped us. Um, and, you know, as you said earlier, it's really not about how big the fund is, but ultimately your performance is what drives your success and particularly success, you know, in, in your future funds, right? So today when we go out to raise, um, you know, our, our prior funds in terms of performance, whether it's TVPI or DPI, they're all in the top decile. So the conversation is very different today, right? And also, you know, maybe we were lucky. FinTech obviously has had a, been a phenomenal sector over the past decade. So no one questions why we are doing FinTech anymore, right? So success begets success, right? Was it hard to lock down that first anchor, that first strategic anchor? Like, um, you know, when you raised your, your first fund, like how, how hard was it? Um, I mean, of course, it's hard. I mean, it's like anything, you know, you, you talk to a lot of people, and, you know, I talk, I tell all the startups that way too, right? You just have to go out there and have lots of meetings to talk to lots of investors, because, you know, there will be some that get what you're trying to do, others that don't. That's not to say anyone is smarter than anyone else. It's just sometimes, you know, it works. And I think for strategic also, it depends on where they are in terms of their strategy and their their cycle of how they're thinking about where they need help, right? Um, so, you know, we, you know, it, it, the first strategy we locked down happens to be a firm that we both Melissa and I knew well, you know, in our past lives, but they were also at a point in time where they were looking to, to think about how to uh, build a fintech strategy. So, you know, timing also matters, right? Thank you, Wei. Um, um, Kathy, I, I was going to say last year when you were on the She Loves Tech Global Summit, you were still <laughs> at Goldman Sachs. And um, less than a year later, uh, obviously, you know, you're now build, building Empowers. Um, how, you know, has the journey been what you expected? You know, um, has it been more challenging? Has it been less challenging? You know, perhaps, perhaps, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it, is it what you expected? Well, I guess the, 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 idea of trying to launch a first time fund with no track record during a global pandemic is probably not the most ideal environment <laughs> um, to try something like this. But, you know, and, and when, when we talked about the thesis for the fund that we wanted it to be ESG you know, integrated in terms of the strategy to ways point to differentiate ourselves, um, I had pushback. I had people say, but Kathy, you know, your background, you should be doing an activist hedge fund, right? Focused on public rather than private equity, which I really did think about. I thought maybe they're right. <laughs> but then I did some soul searching and asked myself, you know, can I picture myself jumping out of bed every day to want to be an activist investor pushing around or trying to push around big, you know, companies? And frankly, I've been kind of indirectly doing that in my prior you know, existence. And it's not that fun, to be honest. Rather, could we try to do you know, engagement investing um, with ESG principles before companies become adults, when they're in their teenage years, when they're smaller, more nimble, and they need help. And we're targeting middle to later stage startups, so not seed or early, so there should be some business traction. They might be looking at some form of exit in the next few years, and they just need some additional support along these lines. But of course, we had this burning question, like would anybody write us a check? <laughs> and if not, you know, we'd go back to score one and think, think about another strategy. But we got very lucky because everybody was grounded. So it wasn't too difficult to find people and have conversations. We are also very um, lucky that we had established relationships with the very top senior people at big Japanese institutional investors and corporates. And I think we got very lucky with the timing because a lot of um, all of our, our investors pretty much have made public commitments to ESGFI all of their asset classes. And they had very few funds or opportunities to get that exposure through VC until we came along. 
And so again, so, so many stars happen to align. Uh, we didn't have one meal, <laughs> we didn't get on one plane um, and we're targeting 150 million. And suffice to say, we're, we're, we're basically almost there. You, you know, again, no track record. <laughs> I think we got super, super, super lucky and very blessed with some fantastic LPs who not just wrote checks, but really, really kind of walked us through, uh, pushed us, challenged us, still challenging us. Um, and it's it's been a really phenomenal um, learning relationship for us. Um, of course, we now have to um, you know show returns, but we're, we are working really, really closely um, with our LPs as well. And we also want, you know, we have this kind of higher mission. It sounds a little idealistic, but a higher mission to, you know, Japan's venture ecosystem is tiny. It's like 150th or 160th out of the United States, um, despite being the world's third largest economy, despite having very high quality talent, um, leading technology, a ton of capital, but why is it so tiny? Uh, and so we think trying to think about, you know, or trying to integrate um, these ESG principles and mindsets at an earlier stage of corporate development can help these companies scale better and go global more easily. Uh, a lot of the companies end up being domestic only. They are so desperate to list. Uh, that's the 90% of exits here is listing. And then they end up staying small or getting smaller. And, and we think this chain can be broken. So we're kind of trying to also do something to help the ecosystem overall. Um, thank you, Kathy and Wei. What I'm hearing from the both of you, and I'm gonna move on to, to you, Helen, is I, I think the convergence of three things. So, so the first thing is obviously your values, right? Your soul searching, or, or I would say in your case, Wei, your instinct. Um, and then with that opportunity that you see in the market, in, in, in your case, uh, way it was it was fintech before you know the fact you know before everybody else's time basically, and Kathy, you know it's is you seeing ESG in sort of a post COVID world, and then finally, like you said, the stars aligning, you know it is um, a mix of both prior relationships with with some of these the, the people who are, who are now considering these strategies, and the fact that the market is now ready. So 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 turning now to Helen, right? In, in your case, what do you see as the your opportunity, and 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 and, and you know for, for you building this fund, you know we'd love to love to learn more about it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, it's uh, you know looking at uh, Southeast Asia as the next growth area. Um, I have um, you know I started my career in VC in the US actually on Sand Hill Road, um, and then I moved to China in '05, and I saw the rise of. Um, you know, then the PC internet, um, and in recent years, the rise of the mobile internet. Uh, but as you know, um, you know, it's a very mature market now in China, and recently there's been some regulatory crackdowns. Um, and I, but I think that, you know, if you look at some um, other regions around the world, there's still a lot of growth and there's still uh, a lot of excitement about uh, these internet sectors. And I think that what I bring is something very different uh, from what other VCs in the region have um, are doing. Uh, basically, I bring my year, years of experience in China and having seen and invested in some of the models uh, that are now being replicated in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a little bit similar to when I first went to China and, you know, we saw the, uh, the same copy uh, to China um, trend uh, based on U.S. models. Uh, so I think that uh, I'm trying to, in a way, I'm, I'm doing what I was doing before, but just in a new region. Um, I love that, Helen. Um, like, uh, I think um, I was based in China for eight years, and I think the pandemic last year brought me home. Um, you know, when I was when I was still trying to to raise um, my my first time, which we have now closed, and uh, I, I completely see the same similar trends with you. Um, in our fund, we call it sort of um, China Southeast Asia, sort of uh, geographical slash technological arbitrage. And I agree with you as well that Southeast Asia's time is now, I would say the time from 2012 to 2020 in China is probably gonna be the next eight years for us, what we call the golden age in, in Southeast Asia. Um, at Teja, we focus on consumer technology, early stage consumer technology, looking at food, retail, and, and wellness, things which have all taken off, um, you know, be, because, um, you know, of the pandemic, but these are things that we we believed in even before. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna talk sort of a little bit more about how, how you guys invest. And, you know, do you think as women, we 
we invest in, we invest differently. I'm not I'm not even necessarily going to say better, but how do you differentiate yourself as as an investor? I think from Kathy, I heard you know a, a lot about values. From Wei, I heard you know the love of entrepreneurs. You know, just loving working with them, supporting them. From Helen, I'm I'm, I'm hearing knowledge from the U.S. You know, um, China across sectors. You know, what differentiates you know um, your fund? You know, how do you invest differently? What do you think makes you a better investor? Um, Wei, maybe. Um, um, I, I don't know if being being women necessarily make us better investors. I think what makes us better investors, you know, is what do we know about the market? Do we are we able to foresee trends before others? So can we in, invest ahead of the curve, right? Do we have, you know, everybody says or, or strives to be value add investors, and how do you really deliver that value, right? For us. It's about how do we work with our entrepreneurs, with help them with everything from thinking about market entry to part of market fit, to help them recruit and build a team, to help them raise their next round of funding, helping them find strategic partners and potential um, acquirers. Um, so these are, you know, what we do, and then that's I think what differentiates us. I think being a sector specific fund also allows us to build very very deep domain expertise. Um, you know. Fintech is is one of those sectors, you know, the, the deeper you go, the, the more you realize there's a lot more to learn. Um, and that that allows us to, I think, um, have a different level of conversation with entrepreneurs than perhaps other other firms can. And it allows us to help them in different ways. Um, you know, I think being women, it's it's, you know, again, perhaps sometimes I find myself and, and I'm sure Helen and Kathy as well. We may be the only women in the boardroom, you know, in, in a lot of companies that we work with. And, you know, perhaps it means we can bring a level of empathy that's different, um, certainly a different perspective on things. And, and, and I think at the end of the day, a healthy board and healthy conversations are had when there are diversity of, a, a diversity of thoughts, right? And perhaps women are a bit less ego driven. We're much more willing to find compromises, to find solutions rather than just purely butting heads, which more often than not, I do see in some of my companies. Um, you know, I think perhaps that, you know, I find that's sometimes what differentiates us a little bit. And I think for some of the male entrepreneurs, um, sometimes perhaps they find it a bit easier to tell us when they're having problems. Uh, it seems less daunting than perhaps, you know, um, going to a, a male board member to share some of these. And then oftentimes, right, it's not about having problems. We all have problems. It's about um, being honest about it and being able to talk about it earlier rather than later and to work together to find solutions. Thank you, Wei. Um, I, I actually read, um, there was a really interesting piece from Bloomberg a couple of years ago about, uh, you know, uh, female investors driving sort of China's tech boom. And I remember one of the, I think, uh, I can't remember which investor uh, she was, but she was also a powerhouse uh, uh, investor. And she said something like, um, very similar to what you just said, but also the fact that um, she, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs, male or female, felt that she was more nurturing because she was she was a woman, and therefore, like you said, were more comfortable telling her when, when, you know, when, when they had issues, etc. Kathy, um, do you think, um, I mean, what differentiates um, you? I mean, apart from the fact that I think you are, you guys are the first <laughs> ESG fund, a venture fund for for Japan. Do you think being a woman uh, gives you a different lens? Does that make you have a more vigorous process? Why, why, why does Japan not have ESG funds before this? Well, I, I, I sorry, don't think we'll be the, the last. There are already other um, ESG funds that have cropped up even in the last few few months. So uh, I hope this is the be beginning of a longer term trend. But I think the key, um, I guess, observation I would have is we're finding, you know, startups that want our help. They understand the why about ESG, but they don't quite know how to do or how to implement it, right? Uh, specifically. And so they're looking to us for tools, for training, for expertise, hands-on uh, involvement. Um, and that's what I think we can bring to the table. Secondly, as you can probably appreciate, I, I, we're, we're working in Japan where female directors are you know, less than 10% for publicly traded companies. So if you think about startups and whether it's State Street or Goldman Sachs Asset Management, they're already voting against Japanese listed companies who don't have any diversity on their boards. So 
for middle to later stage startups here, if they're looking for female or diversity on the board, it doesn't have to be female, it could be foreigners, it could be LGBTQ, whatever, but they tend to be drawn to us because they think we've got networks, we've got access to people that perhaps your run of the mill Japanese male VC you know, fund might not have. So that's actually, I think that we've, we've found that as an advantage. But I think to Wei's point, this is not about gender, it's really about cognitive diversity. It's about challenging perhaps opinions on a, on a board or with, with management because people are afraid to ask or challenge or, or, or raise uncomfortable issues. So um, that's what I think that the value of diversity can bring, um, but it's not just you know, gender. Absolutely. Helen, you know, you've been an investor for 20 years, right? Um, you know, and, and I think the, 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 the VC space in, in Southeast Asia is barely, is not even 20 years. How, what have you enjoyed the most about working with entrepreneurs? How, how do you work? How do you like to work with entrepreneurs? Um, I like, um, you know, obviously I, I see it as a partnership and, you know, to be able to uh, brainstorm on strategy, to be able to discuss uh, issues facing the company, uh, to be able to help them uh, think through things regarding team building. Um, and I think that what I've seen in the past is a lot of companies, they go through ups and downs. Uh, there will always be, you know, times that are, that are pretty rough. And I think um, being able to be there for them and being able to, you know, sometimes be a source of encouragement. Uh, to me, that's, uh, you know, and then see them come through it. I mean, to me, that's the most rewarding part of, you know, working with entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, I mean, you, to the question you asked about, you know, how are we different? I do think nurturing is a good word. I mean, being a mother, um, I do see that, you know, sometimes women bring a bit of more of that um, to, you know, the portfolio companies that they work with. Um, I was reminded uh, by one entrepreneur uh, recently that, uh, you know, when COVID first hit and everybody was very, very down and everybody was very, very concerned about whether their companies were going to last. Um, I, I did a sharing session with uh, some of my portfolio companies and I told them, you know, what happened you know, years ago during the dot-com uh, bubble bursting and then during SARS, you know, how hard it was. Uh, even, you know, Alibaba, which I was involved in at that time, um, you know, they they had a very hard time. They had a employee who got the um, SARS and everybody was under quarantine and you know I shared with them basically you know how they got through it and um, you know he told me afterwards that he felt it was very um, very heartwarming and very encouraging and he felt it was uh, maybe a bit different from how you know male VCs interact with him so I, I found that to be also very encouraging. Thank you, Helen. So I'm seeing, uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing three things, right, in terms of, of, of what you guys value about investing. Um, I think with from way, um, you know, deep, deep knowledge, especially when it becomes, you know, when it's been vertically focused. Kathy, I think, you know, networks and, 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 and entrepreneurs looking to you for that, because, you know, you're potentially the only one, your only fund in the market which can, which can provide that. And then Helen, you know, it, it, you know, that support, which is more than just financial or even necessarily knowledge based, you know, sometimes is, is that encouragement. I think um, as, as, as the three of you must, you know, will be aware, American classic American style VC, Silicon Valley VC is 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 diversified, you know, highly diversified um, checks, um, spray and pray. And, and on top of that, probably not that much support, um, you know, for portfolio companies, you know, apart from, I would say, you know, the, 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 the top players, you know, which have large enough teams. And what I'm hearing here, not just from the three of you, but from what I understand of the industry, actually, is that a lot of women, you know, like um, women who are leading and building their own funds actually prefer, like this more focused approach, more portfolio support. I think I heard Wei said everything from fundraising, you know, you know, dealing with the st strategic, you know, even filling up um, talent gaps. That's something that we do at Teja as well. And we become, you know, very good at doing that in the consumer space, everything from supply chain, manufacturing, all the way to, you know, strategic investment. And so, you know, in, in many ways, I think, you know, it, it also comes down to the way I think the three of you, for example, can you know, are or can can change what venture capital, the way venture capital uh, is played, especially in, in Asia, which is still very, very much emerging. Has it been hard for the three of you, you know, as 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 independent, you know, fund managers to attract talent way, you know, when you first started off in fintech people, before people believed in it? Kathy, you know, ESG, which is, which I mean, I think ESG is a, is a big keyword these days, but uh, but but I, I, I'm not necessarily sure, you know, um, how big that was in, in Japan and, and Helen obviously building a new fund. How easy has it been to attract talent? Um, Kathy, maybe you want to start? Well, you know, we, we, 
made it fairly clear what our fund's remit uh, was about from the very start. And so, of course, we're not a fund for any venture capitalists. Um, and I think for us, it was very important to align the mission of our, our fund with our people. And so, yes, we could have scouted for a top ranked, you know, huge, very strong uh, track record venture capitalist with a lot of experience. But if they didn't have that belief that we help, we hold, which is that we believe ESG is not just this sort of box ticking compliance exercise when you have time, but it's actually central to the sustainability and scalability of one's business, then the fit wouldn't work. So the fit for us was super, super important. And we were lucky to find you know, fantastic talent. Um, we have a Chinese national. We, as I said, we have one male. <laughs> we, we'll look to hire more. Uh, we have an American. We have, um, you know, several non-Japanese on our advisory board. We have one U.S.-based operating partner. So, yeah, it's again goes comes down comes down to diversity. But the underlying thread or consistent in terms of our recruiting has been, are you aligned with this mission that we have? Because without that. Um, it's difficult to to work in this small team. Way when you when you first started versus now, I mean, you know, was it hard, um, you know, to 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 hire the right talent? I mean, before people believed that fintech could be what it is today. Um, you know, it, it's never easy to hire good talent. I think for any business, whether you're running a fund or doing a startup, um, talent is probably one of the most important. Um, thing you can have, right? Especially in our business, it's a people business. Um, I think for us, you know, it, it, perhaps it's gotten a bit easier over the years to hire because we are more established as, as a brand. Um, and uh, I think for anyone interested in FinTech, um, you know, we're, we're definitely somebody they would be interested in talking to or working with. Um, I think for us, it's, you know, to Kathy's point, it's about finding the right fit. We, you know, uh, when Melissa and I first started the fund, we, you know, there's a reason it's not called the Melissa and Wade Fund, right? We, we, we want the fund ideally to, to, to last a very long time and maybe even beyond, you know, us. Um, so we want people who, who want to be in this business and learn the business and grow with the business. Um, so they, they have to be passionate, right, about, the, about investing in fintech wanting to be the best fintech fund there, there, there is in the world, not just in Asia. Um, want, you, know, you, have, you have to have a sense of curiosity. You want to get out of bed every day and think what's going to happen, um, not just what's already happened, but what's going to happen next year, three years from now, five years from now, so we can invest ahead of the trends. Um, you know, we want people who are, who are passionate about wanting to work with the entrepreneurs because at the end of the day, you know, we're only as good as the people we back, right? And the companies that we back. Um, and, you know, I would say we went through periods for a while there, we, we were almost all women. And I, I don't, I was, and that wasn't because, you know, men didn't want to work for us. I think just <laughs> a lot of women, they saw an opportunity to work for a women-led fund. So, so we, we had access to a lot of amazing women. Um, but we also, you know, we, truly believe in diversity and diversity of thoughts and perspectives. So, so now we have a, a very balanced team in terms of uh, not just gender, but, you know, on our team, we, we have colleagues from, you know, 10 different countries. We speak 13 different languages, right? Because we live in a global world today and uh, you know, we, we invest globally. We want to be able to understand, you know, have the global perspective, but also have the local market knowledge and, and insights. Um, but yeah, I, th I mean, for sure, I think it's a lot easier today than it was when we first started, but it's never easy, <laughs> even for the biggest, best firms in the world. Yeah. I, I used to think when I first started out, uh, you know, as a venture capitalist, I, I used to think, okay, the, the biggest, the most important thing I had to do is become the best investor I could be. But I guess when you're a founding partner, just like the three of you, I realized that, um, you know, to build the best firm, it was actually about finding the best talent who would then make the best investments versus trying to just make all the best investments yourself. And that's actually a very, very uh, different challenge, which I don't think I really fully contemplated, um, you know, w w when I started. Um, and, and the other thing which I loved about what you said, Wei, is, um, yeah, I, I think we 
even though we were building a gender lens VC fund, it was very important for me to have two male and two female partners um, uh, on the IC. And, 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 and I think increasingly, I'm learning a lot from the young. Um, most of our analysts are between the ages of 22 and 25. And every day, all they're telling me about is crypto is changing retail. NFTs are changing retail morning to night. <laughs> so I sit there and I and I actually listen to them. I actually listen to them. And then I, I, I used to be very, for example, against gaming, right? Because I felt, okay, you know what? That's not a sort of a women-focused sector. But uh, my young analyst came to me and said, actually, you know, Virginia, this is the data. You're wrong. Um, in e game, in esports, um, in, in in Indonesia, for example, it's 50 50. And I just shut up because I was like, "Yep, you're right. I need to learn from you." Okay, keep 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 pounding me with with all this stuff. So so my team are my, my actually my my also um, my my way to the market. One final question um, for the three of you, um, you know, all powerhouses um, on on this panel. Um, I think there were a lot of um, in the earlier panels. You know, there were a lot of uh, women and a lot of them early investors building their own funds or entrepreneurs and. One of the things they were all very curious about was actually how to access sort of institutional capital. As, as I've closed my maiden fund and moving into launching my second fund at the end of the year, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pondering a lot of these questions uh, myself. Um, way you built the first and also now the largest fintech fund for Asia. Um, Kathy, your first fund, you know, you, you, you are, I think you said you, you're almost there hitting your 150 million target, you know, from and, and I assume from, from institutionals as well. And Helen, I assume, you know, you'll go the same way. So what do you think, you, you know, what can you share with us in terms of advice, in terms of um, what 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 leads to successful institutional fundraising? Um, you know, is it just relationships? You know, is there a secret sauce? You know, what's your advice for us? Wei, you want to you wanna start? <laughs> uh I don't know if there is a secret sauce. If, if, if there is one, I haven't found it yet. Um, I think there's a lot of trial by, trial by error. Um, you know, I think for for when we raised our first fund, we, you know, perhaps because I, I came out of a strategic role, um, you know, we saw the value of having um, financial services, or financial institutions as part of our OP base, because not only would they bring capital, but they will also help us um, enhance our domain expertise and, and our network within the ecosystem that can ultimately help the companies that we invest. So we specifically targeted um, financial institutions that, you know, and it was also good timing, right? At that time, everybody was trying to figure out what fintech meant and how fintech was going to challenge the traditional incumbents. So, you know, it is probably, a, you know, a combination of, of hopefully having the right idea, but also good timing. Um, to be able to, uh, you know, access some of that capital for the first fund. I think obviously for, for the successor funds, um, as we built our track record and it becomes easier to go to the more, you know, what you would say, the more traditional fund of funds or endowments type of LPs. Um, you know, ultimately, if you are good at what you do and you generate good returns, um, investors, you know, there's a lot of capital today in the world that, that need to be put to work. Kathy? Yeah, I think just finding investors who are aligned with your fund's mission is um, very key. Second, even though we didn't have a venture capital investing track record, or we had track records in our other careers, be it public equity fund management, be it investment research, investment banking, management consulting. So in the due diligence, which is super heavy with institutions, get ready for that. Um, there was a lot of questions, right? So what is that track record, that alternative track record? And I think for women, we tend to downplay, you know, oh, we don't have a track record. Oh, nobody's going to give us money. Oh, we'll be us. You know, push your positives, right? What, 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 are you, what are you good at in your strengths? And people will listen to you. And again, like, wait, wait, so don't give up uh, after the first few rejections. Just keep on going. You, you will find you know, somebody and if, in, in Japan, if one major institution does it, then go to their competitor. And I guarantee you, at least they'll have a conversation with you. So, yeah. um, Thank you, Kathy. And Helen, any tips? Um, I, I think I'm too early, but I, I'm in the fundraising process. But I would say that based on my interactions with institutional LPs, I think they look for two things. Uh, one is consistency. And so that means, you know, consistency of returns over time. They want to know that this is a long-term fund uh, that was going to be around. And then uh, I would say, secondly, is communication. So, you know, whether it's good news, bad news, you need to communicate uh, what happened, why it happened, and how you're going to deal with it. Yeah. Um, 
thank you, ladies. Um, this was an absolute um, pleasure and, 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 and honor. Um, keep inspiring um, all of us. Um, you know, he, all three of you are my role models. And um, there are a lot, a lot of women um, uh, listening to, to, to all of you today and, and also a, a lot of men. And uh, thank you again for your time and, and, and your insights. Um, uh, and, uh, um, well, you know, welcome, welcome to come to Shilos Tech anytime. Thanks, ladies.